Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I am your host, Aaron, and joining me are... Christian. And Joe. And Quentin. All right. Thanks, Quentin, for joining today. He is our second non-shill guest host. Woo! Yeah, pretty excited. <laughs> yeah. We're starting to work through our backlog of people who want to be on the show, which is great. It's quite a backlog, too. You guys better like these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> We're just realizing everybody just wants to come on and, and share their maker stuff. <laughs> I think everyone just wants to come on and drink with us. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what is everybody drinking tonight? Chris, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. No, all good, all good. So, I am still going through my backlog um, of stuff that I have left over from my friend's giving. So, uh, tonight I am having... Revolution beering or brewing Fistmas, a holiday ale that Joe brought over for me, actually. You're welcome. So, yeah. This totally doesn't mean that I forgot to get beer on my way home tonight and I'm drinking this. So totally That's not that. fine. That stuff was delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a five finger Fistmas? It, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I'm drinking a uh, session IPA from Ballast Point called Even Keel Mingo, and it's phenomenal. Nice. What else is in it, Joe? Um, I'm going to guess hops because it's an IPA. <laughs> huh. Right? Interesting. Yeah. What are the ideological views of the guy who made those hops, Joe? Do you know? Yeah, we need the backstory <laughs> of the hop farmer to really, you know, enjoy the the mouthfeel. <laughs> How is the mouthfeel, by the way? Um, <laughs> it's tart and, uh, you know, beery. It's very, very uh, um, carbonated. It's it's a pretty low... <laughs> beery uh, views by Joe. Beer percent, though. It is quite, like, quite This is beery. a good project beer. It's only 3.8%, so it's a good project beer. Yeah. There you Stay go. Stay focused. Uh. I am drinking, um, not beer, I'm not really much of a beer guy, but I am drinking uh, Jack Daniels Single Barrel, Ooh, um, nice. which is my nice. sipping drink of choice. Uh, so Single Barrel is not blended like regular Jack, yep. um, comes in a fancy bottle, uh, it's pretty good stuff. That is normally what I am drinking when I have a cigar. <laughs> that is... It's a perfect cigar drink. Exactly. I always forget you smoke cigars, Chris. We need to, we need to get together when it's nice out. Oh, I absolutely. Yeah. No, could like bonfire cigar. Mm, I'm always down for that. I got really into pipe smoking a year or so ago, and I lost my smoking partner. And now I have, I didn't smoke at all last year. That's a disappointment. It's like the most relaxing thing I found. Mm. Just the, the ritual of the lighting and the packing and the relighting because it goes out and... It was real nice. No, it's like it's almost its own whole thing of just like that might be an episode because like I can talk cigars and I can talk like tobacco and all that. And that that has its own culture of whole thing. Oh, yeah. Like, it's an oh, incredible yeah. thing. But what are we actually talking about tonight? <laughs> well, hey, I, I, I haven't gone yet. What are you doing? Oh, go for it. Go for it. What are you what are you drinking? <laughs> I am drinking the. Kirkland Premium Small Batch Bourbon. Hey, I guess I, I bet you couldn't have guessed that, listeners, that you would be drinking something Kirkland. <laughs> hey, Costco, if you would like to sponsor, I will drink. I will drink all of your liquor. <laughs> That's a good thought. Oh, uh, insert future ad segment here. <laughs> yeah, distilled and bottled. In the sovereign state of Tennessee. Excellent. Excellent. I think it has to be to be bourbon, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> is, so. Is that what makes it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's specific rules. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can do you can have Kentucky bourbon. But does it have to be labeled Kentucky bourbon and it can't be straight as bourbon? It might be. Like Is that is that how it gets th around it? That's the thing, is Kentucky bourbon. I don't know. 
I, I have friends from that like are real into that. I'll ask. <laughs> so does Kentucky bourbon have to be brewed in Kentucky? I I, I would I, assume so. <laughs> I have no. Hey, someone on the internet, tell us. All right, <laughs> correct us on our misknowledge here. R slash makers on tap. Let us know the <laughs> bourbon problems. <laughs> Could that be its own pro- podcast? Is hashtag bourbon problems? <laughs> yes. No, it's just drinking problems. <laughs> nah, and it's just that sounds just like us. a depressing podcast, though. <laughs> no, it's really just like that one scene in an airplane where. He just fails to drink a cup of water and it just spills <laughs> like, all over him. And that's when he developed the drinking problem. <laughs> yep. Okay. Or, <laughs> or the ever present Homer Simpson quote The cause of and answer to all of life's problems. <laughs> oh, yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh. All right. That was a very healthy alcohol segment (laughs) longer longer than it's ever been so with that we can go into our news segment Uh, we have a couple interesting news articles that i found absolutely one of that one one of which is um an organization called ot vinta they are a 3d design and uh, 3d modeling helping resource they actually released all the um, 3D models for a 3D printable, servo-driven, mechanical, digital clock. It's a very loaded title, <laughs> but it's your it's your average seven-segment clock, like in all of your everyday cheap clocks, but all of the segments turn on and off by a, a servo moving it out of the visible way. So it just folds it. I don't know what do you call that perpendicular to your line of sight, so you can't see it. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there's seven of those your your standard blue servos per segment, and they've got a neat YouTube video for it, and it's just lousy as crap. I mean, loud as crap. <laughs> Where it's just you know you just hear servo crap going back and forth to turn the things around. But, but man, it's like super it cool because cool yeah, it's like yeah. it's like the very essence of what this podcast is about. Yes. Unnecessarily complicated, but awesome at the same time. Yes. <laughs> this this is absolutely <laughs> something like a massive where it was like, hey, we got a thing that we got to do in like two weeks. What can we come up with? <laughs> yep. And it's it's freaking awesome. Like it's it's so much like it's mesmerizing to watch it for a little bit. Just absolutely. If you have the chance, go and watch this YouTube video because it's just it's a really cool project. I think it's one of those projects where they probably come up with, with like a way better idea beforehand, but it's like way too practical. They're like, yeah, that's a great idea, but we could make this instead. It's either like, that or like, hey, what do we have lying around in the shop right now? <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole pile of servos. What can we do with a whole pile of servos? S- have you ever you made know, a seven segment clock out of servos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like we it sounds like we missed our opportunity with all the bearings we had at the makerspace. Uh, I was literally going to say, do they have the opposite <laughs> problem where we have too many problems, they have too many servos? Because we'll trade that problem. <laughs> I'll tell you, I know where most of those bearings are. So if they're not very far away from the makerspace. Sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, man. moving on. It's just somebody else's problem now. Yes, that's exactly what <laughs> nice. it is. That's all, that's all I wanted. Just somebody else to worry about it. Yep. Anyways, it's like the se- somebody else's problem field from Hitchhiker's Guide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna wait to Cloud Software, where it's just someone else's computer. Yeah. That your data's on. Yeah, so the second article, which I thought Joe would love, is a user by, that goes by the name of Ostiwawa. He had he made an electric drift trike, and he didn't feel like it was fast enough. He originally had a, a little hub wheel motor in the front, which doesn't really get you much, you know, drifty. Yeah, those are really mm-hmm. common. Yeah, those are pretty common in, like, electric bikes mm-hmm. and the bicycles not tricycles yeah 
but he replaced it with a 1500 watt brushless water cooled DC motor. <laughs> yeah. And it has an accompanying YouTube video and it looks beefy AF. Oh yeah. So I, I, I am actually super excited about this because I was planning on doing this swap for my drift trike for MakerFest this year, just so I could drift around all the people that told me I couldn't ride it the last two years. <laughs> like, ha ha, I'm not violating your rules now with my gas engine. And um, I, I think it, what he has on the video is actually the motor I was planning on using. So, oh, neat. Um, I, well, now you know you need to water cool it. Yeah, it's very <laughs> useful information. Thank you, Ostiwala. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, check out his videos. It's real fun. Yeah. Now this it looks like a whole because he's going and uh, he says he gets up to uh, fifty kilometers per hour, and which is roughly about thirty one miles per hour. Um, yeah. So the thing kicks like. <laughs> did, yeah, did you just do the math? That's like a uh, thirty-one miles an hour in a in a drift trike is like wanting to die speeds because usually <laughs> they don't have brakes. I mean, mine certainly hey. doesn't have brakes. Right. Some of us, w- some of us would like that, Joe. <laughs> some some people would. The last kid that did, he rolled the drift trike and broke the carburetor off my engine. So you know. Oops. <laughs> things to things to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing that we were talking about this week is the MakerBot method printer has been announced. And uh, I have opinions. <laughs> Man. You do, huh? <laughs> That's new. I just want to know if we're actually going to, like, uh, starting this off, does anybody have anything nice to say? Mm. About the printer? Not yeah, really about nice the things to say. Yeah, it looks neat. It does look neat. And, you know, um, you guys go ahead. Well, <laughs> I mean, the main thing, because we were kind of like looking over the article, or at least the uh, the specs page on MakerBot. And I I know that MakerBot is like stupidly priced most of the time. But like the price point on this one specifically, which is $6,500. Um, really just like made me go like why the frick are they even trying at this point because they it literally says bridging the gap between industry and desktop 3d printing and it's like what you're losing all your clientele like that makes no well, sense to me maybe but, they're bridging the gap in the price yeah they are they really are so and that's why i wanted you to talk first um because this printer is essentially a scaled down uprint or dimension from stratasys um okay and if you've ever printed with those they there are some very specific takeaways that like if you look at this printer you're like oh yeah they they totally took that from the uprint they took this from the dimension and you know these things are new um and the uprint starts at twenty thousand and has an eight by eight by eight ish build area and the dimension uh, start started. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if they're still running the dimension line anymore, but that started around thirty to fifty thousand. So this really does put them right in between the highest end MakerBot, which was um, uh, of this print size, which was like three and a half to four thousand, and the bottom end U print, which is like twenty. Um, in, in like. Things like the filament drawers and their um, their spool loaders and the climate controlledness of all that, and then the heated build uh, area instead of just a heated build plate. Those are all takeaways from those higher end printers. Oh, now, they own the IP for that stuff too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is it says they're leveraging patents from Stratasys. Yeah, yeah. Because that's innovation. Innovation. <laughs> Leveraging patents that you've had for 20 years. Good job, guys. Um, but like the things that irk me about this thing is there's there's no real innovation happening here. It's a dual extrusion printer that prints one material. You can print PLA. And the PLA that you can print comes in like 10 colors. Not even that. 
less than that. And then the other head prints soluble support material, which is PVA. And we've been able to do this in sub $2,000 printers for, I don't know, four years ish now. Quentin? Um, no, it's been longer than that. I mean, since the replicator 2x well that (laughs) so my first printer that ever had was a replicator 2x and we got that i think i was still in college so it would have been like six or seven years ago yeah so it and this printer is directly targeted at like the ultimaker s5 market which is almost two thousand dollars cheaper and can do the the pva and pla really really well um, and is still an open source ish product and is ran by a company that everyone's not real frustrated with. <laughs> the bar is very low, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. So when I, I was working at a, a, a small company last year and they were spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month sending out engineering models to some company to print them out on a Stratasys and then ship them back like same day or next day. And the the sizes that they were working with were roughly this size. Majority of them were about this size Mm -hmm. Um, for the tolerances that they were wanting. I mean, this, I feel like this is probably more geared towards that more market. Yep. Yeah. And and when Aaron says this size, the, um, I gotta scroll back to the seven and a half by seven and a half by seven and three quarters. Wow. Okay. So yeah, it's a U print. It's a <laughs> it's a mid grade U print. Good job, guys. You didn't even try. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't go for at least twelve by twelve. Yeah, I'm. I am too. But hey, there's a camera with a resolution of four six or six forty by four eighty. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I I'm curious on um, the print reliability of this. Um, they do have some things in the software that I'm kind of interested in. Uh, you can directly import SolidWorks files and Inventor files and Step files, and uh, that's stuff that I've been asking uh, slicer companies for for a really long time. Yeah, um, slicers should just have the ability to do that. Yeah, it, especially because a lot of those file types like step and IGES are mesh file types anyway. So even if you have to remesh them in the software to an STL, like, it's not a far stretch. Um, so, you know, maybe that stuff's coming. The um, the big things I'm worried about for people buying this are, uh, you know, they have proprietary tool heads again. And I know for a fact that on the the newer uh, replicator machines, they were planned failure for their tool heads. Like they they planned for them to die every two hundred hours, and then you had to spend three hundred dollars on a new tool head. And what they sold them the... in three packs for a reason. So planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I do profit. Yeah, I had a a MakerBot rep specifically tell me that. So. You know, I'm sure these tool heads are, are much more expensive. So good luck, guys. <laughs> so what do you think about the departure from the consumer maker market to the more industrial? For MakerBot or in general? Uh, both. Because we talked a bit about it in the episode with uh, Brandon from SMW3D or Hobby Fab, And we also mentioned it with uh, E3D. You know, That's why I kind of like jumped at the price because like I was for I I immediately was looking back at that conversation going here is another company that's starting to mainly look at companies rather than consumers. And that's why I was like, but now that I've had that explained to me, that makes a lot more sense as to what they're going to. But I'm I'm actually more amped to hear what Joe has to say. <laughs> well, since um, Stratus is bot maker bot. MakerBot has departed from the um, maker market as their target. Uh, when they when Stratasys bought MakerBot, they moved to 
um, print firms and colleges and uh, research companies and prototyping machines. Um, that was their main focus. They they could care less if like Aaron, you as an individual bought their printer because there was no profit in it for them. Um, yeah, I, the market's in a weird spot. Um, we were just talking about this earlier uh, uh, in our makerspace chat where um, there's so many new people in the, in the 3d printing world that don't even understand what rep wrap was to begin with. And like it's roots that when you, when you say certain things, they just, they just don't even understand why you would even care. Um, so I don't know. I'm curious to see where this next year goes. What yeah. do you think, Q? Uh, I think that the lower the barrier the entry gets, the worse it'll be. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've seen that in a few other things, where as things get cheaper, you get less and less capable people buying in, and it just kind of kills it. Yeah. Um, the more capable you, people you, get sick of asking, answering questions. Right, and... yeah, you kind of lose your skill set, and you lose, I mean, the, nobody really has any passion. People are just kind of buying it because everybody else is kind of doing it. Um, you know, 3D printing is kind of a buzzword, and people see ads on Facebook for a $100 printer and think, oh, awesome, perfect. And they buy it, and it's garbage, and... Yep, uh, the house burns down. <laughs> the house could burn down. Um, I know... A lot of people this year have asked me for recommendations on a printer, um, and I've tried to steer them towards something semi-reliable, but a lot of people are going towards, like, the Ender 3 and and the Creality stuff, and, you know, that's that's all fine and good, but, you know, that stuff takes a little tweaking. I mean, yep. the Ender's a kit, right? So these are people that may not necessarily be mechanically inclined, but <laughs> don't know what they're getting into. Yeah, mm-hmm. I actually, uh, um, my uncle, who is a, a machinist by trade, and he is a salesman now for some tool company. Um, his grandson now, he's only like five or five at the time, but he was asking me, you know, my recommendation for, or if there's any printers in the, you know, two to $300 range that he could, you know, work with him on because, you know, he's he's not using it himself and it's just this little kid using it, but it'd be a great project for them both to work on to learn how the technology works. Um, not expecting a fully functioning thing at that price, but and it was kind of hard not to recommend an ender at that point because a few of our members of the space have gotten them. And once they're put together, they actually work fairly well. Yep. And I've heard that same thing as well. They're, they're actually pretty good. It's hard to knock it. I think if at somebody, the same time, it's sad. if somebody who is going to know how to, use it and is willing to learn um i think that the lower barrier of entry is great uh Mm -hmm. i have some friends who just haven't gotten one you know because they were too expensive or too difficult and then they finally bit the bullet on a on an ender actually and have been having a great time with it yep so i mean it kind of goes both ways i think you're getting you're getting probably more people who shouldn't necessarily be involved involved but you're also getting the people who wanted to join and couldn't before for various reasons now are jumping mm-hmm. in. Yep. I don't think that... I know there was some discussion in a previous podcast you guys had about 3D printing and health of that hobby and if it was essentially dying and 3D printing in general is dying, but I think, you know, I still see lots of innovation in various ways that people are using it and people are just discovering it still, even though that it's been around for quite a while. So I don't think it's quite on the way out yet. No, I don't either. Not by any means. Yeah. Yeah. That was a nice natural wrap up to our new segment. With that, uh, Quentin, what do you do? Why are you even here? Um, so I started my own little company, uh, two years ago. Uh, originally, it was to uh, sell 3D printers to my university. Um, and that actually worked out pretty well. I had a contract with them 
um, sold them some 3D printers and serviced them um, and handled parts and all that. Um, and then I discovered Instagram. And when that happened, then I discovered all these rings that people were making out of crazy materials. And so uh, I've kind of slowly transitioned my business into that. So I've basically been focusing on uh, various forms of jewelry, uh, mostly rings, but I've gotten into some other stuff um, made out of basically anything uh, that can be manipulated. Either uh, a lot of stuff is machined, but um, other things are molded. Um, <clears throat> for a little background, uh, my father has a machine shop, and when I was in high school, I not exactly sure why. Um, I think I had discovered some, uh, I think I had discovered carbon fiber in general, uh, through paintball when I was in high school. And I discovered a guy who goes by Black Badger, uh, was making carbon fiber rings and I really, really wanted one. Um, but I couldn't make one. I couldn't find any carbon and I couldn't afford one. So I decided to just make a ring out of stainless. Uh, at my father's machine shop. So I did that. That was like in 2008 or so. So yeah, 10 years ago. Um, and I made a few for friends in high school. Never really went anywhere. Then in college, um, we were working on our formula cars, our senior design project. And a good friend of mine um, <clears throat> had noticed my ring and we got to talking and he said, that we should buy some titanium and make one. Just we were in and out of the shop all the time and just looking for random stuff to do. So I just went on and bought a bar of titanium and made a few rings. Kind of got some experience with it there and never really went with it um, up until uh, about a year ago uh, with the Instagram thing. Kind of uh, got a revival. Um, most of the time I had seen rings made from you know, basic stuff like single metals, titanium, tungsten, that sort of thing. Uh, but turns out there's like a crazy number of ring makers making rings out of some insane stuff. Um, super materials, um, titanium blends and Damascus, um, all kinds of custom materials. Uh, a big thing in the last year or so was a thing called Superconductor, uh, which is the uh, actual cable for... Uh, cat scan machines which has niobium rods running through it that's copper um and you mm. can etch the copper and it leaves the niobium and it kind of looks like uh dragon scales uh in certain things so oh, really that's cool. cool um <clears throat> uh, my business kind of involved uh into that but i've always kind of been a maker um besides the machine shop my dad also has a hobby shop so I've been messing around with RC stuff, uh, planes and drones and cars and stuff, uh, basically all my life. So I've always been a little bit of a tinkerer, um, and I've just kind of uh, evolved into making money, um, and at some point it becomes a business. Uh, I liked you guys' segment on the uh, burnout uh, issue. I thought uh, <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, Christian, you had that. Uh, story about uh, editing that video uh, along your trip oh, yeah. and how that yeah. totally ruined it for you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not completely burned out yet. <laughs> I've made a <laughs> lot of rings. Um, uh, and it, Certain ones are getting less fun, but uh, there's still a lot of material combinations and things that I haven't done yet. Uh, and, I, and I do still enjoy it. You know, it's a good escape uh, from from the real world for a little while to go and, and create things, you know, you guys understand yep. kind of like oh, yeah. uh, its own form of relaxation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of machines do you use to make these rings? Um, <clears throat> so I actually bought a lathe from Joe and I've been using that. It's a still regret that <laughs> it's a <laughs> Harbor Freight. Uh, it's just a little one, just a, a nine by 20. <clears throat> um, but it's been, uh, actually it's been awesome. I've bought some new tooling. Um, I did go through and clean it all 
and uh, get her tuned up. But it has been awesome. And I'll, I've cut, you know, anything from aluminum to titanium, stainless Damascus, uh, zirconium, which is a uh, uh, it's similar to titanium. It's more dense, uh, but it has some unique properties. So zirconium, when it oxidizes, produces hydrogen, and it tends to catch on fire when you cut it. So you'll just be That's machining nice. it, and it's like throwing off chips that are burning like as bright as the sun. Uh, and <laughs> it actually burns so hot that it'll decompose water into hydrogen and oxygen. So you got to be careful. Make sure everything's very right. clean. Uh, piles of sand nearby, that sort of thing. Yep. <clears throat> it sounds like a blast. Uh, <laughs> uh, Literally. It, You're welcome. The, the cool <laughs> thing about zirconium is that <laughs> when you oxidize it, so you know how titanium or stainless will turn like purple, uh, blues, and golds? Uh, mm-hmm. Zirconium will turn black, uh, which is oh, a pretty yeah. unique property, and it's 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 actually pretty hard to get black metal in jewelry. Uh, there's a few huh. ways to do it, but zirconium's the easiest, and it, it's the best wearing. Interesting. Uh, it's extremely hard oxi- uh, oxide, and I think uh, Joe, how's your ring holding up? I was just looking at it. The uh... The main body of the ring is looking pretty good, but the edges are starting to shine. So I actually made my titanium wedding ring on the lathe that I sold Quentin uh, a few years ago. And then, like, about a year and a half ago, I gave him my ring to turn it black with a... How did you do it again? So, stainless and titanium, you can turn black if you heat them red hot and then you quench them in WD-40. So, hmm. I, I'm not sure who figured that out exactly, huh. but um, it works really well, and it uh, turns it like pitch black, and it holds up pretty well. Uh, yeah. It, it creates some kind of scale. I'm not sure the exact chemistry that happens there, but uh, it turns out pretty awesome. It's worn way better than anodizing, I can tell you that. Yeah, anodizing. Um, so, electrically anodizing titanium you just see people on YouTube do it. They'll put it in like distilled water with borax, or you can even use like Coca-Cola. Uh, and then, you know, you can apply a voltage to it and it'll change colors that wears off super fast. Um, yeah. but if you do it with heat, it'll hold up pretty good. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what the difference is. The color depends on the thickness of the oxide layer. So I would assume they'd be the same for the same color, but the different methods definitely makes a different lasting finish. Yeah, like oh, the electric anodizing I've done on this ring usually lasts like a month, month and a half maybe. Yep. Before it's completely silver again. It's interesting. Really interesting. There's a. I, it sounds simple, you know, just making a ring, you know, the round. I, I I haven't gotten into doing any stone setting or anything like that yet, so you know you just think, well, it's just it's just some round pieces put together, uh, but there's a lot of intricacies. Uh, especially when you get into multi-part rings or weird material combinations. Um, like, you know, how do you bind, bond wood to metal in a way yeah. that can survive being on your hand? Which, mm-hmm. you know, people think that their hands really, you know, don't really go through too much. But actually, rings get abused pretty hard. Um, so it's it's sometimes a challenge. Uh, I, have, I have somebody right now who wants me to make a ring that's going to end up being four four pieces so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge as well going to be press fits uh, and that sort of thing Hmm. but uh, there's a lot of crazy um, materials Uh, one of my favorites is a thing called fordite which is uh, layers of car paint which is built up like on fixtures from when they painted cars from the overspray uh, which doesn't really happen anymore with the electrostatic paint but uh, you end up with this like crazy, swirly, multi-layer, um, basically, uh, paint chunk that uh, has all these metallic layers that shines up and looks awesome when you cut it. It's hard to describe. Um, it's pretty incredible. We should put some pictures of it, and we'll, we'll just put Q's 
store in show notes so you can see. Yeah, you can link my my uh, Instagram channel if you want. Yeah. Well, now we're just showing. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, that's Fortnite. Fun. Fortnite's really cool. It's Fortnite really is cool. really cool. That uh, sounds cool. <clears throat> unfortunately, there's another material supplier who's like completely just ruined the whole Fortnite thing by selling tons of it to a bajillion people. So now it's like way overused. You'll see that happen as well with <laughs> with cool materials. Somebody, you'll see like one or two people start using it, and then pretty soon everybody's using it, and then it's no longer cool. <laughs> Did they monopolize the automobile overspray paint chip market? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure what happened, because it's not exactly easy to get a hold of, especially in large pieces, since it's not like these places are saving it for anything, you know? They just scrape it off and throw it in the garbage. But mm-hmm. there's some enterpri- uh, enterprising automobile workers somewhere scraping off some big chunks and selling them for <laughs> for big bucks. <clears throat> so hey, whatever works, man. Whatever works. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I've learned a lot, uh, a lot about things that I never would have guessed, like woods and glues. But so much information about glue. I just I never would have expected to know that much about adhesives. But uh, an interesting segue that kind of relates to MakerBot, One that guy that I had told you about originally, that Black Badger guy, who had uh, actually got me inspired to make that first ring, he just made a ring for Brie Pettis. Because he is also into watches, and that's what Brie does now, is watches. So I thought, I, he did, he... Uh, I thought he did the um, other mill. His company bought up a company that does other mill. That could be. He has uh, some kind of 3D printed watch line. As oh, well. that's right. Yeah, I remember that. And they're super overpriced. Holy crap. Yes. <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. I don't know that they're uh, justified, but uh, I mean, if you could model it, you could just have Shapeways make it and put a strap on it. <laughs> but. Uh, I just thought if that it was that easy. Anybody would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I had a question for you, Quentin. Yeah, sure. You had showed me a ring a while back. Yeah, I think it was like stainless, but you had quartz inlaid in it. Or some, oh, some crushed sort of... turquoise. Oh, turquoise. Yeah. Was it literally just crushed, or did it... did you grow it on the ring, or how'd that work? Oh, oh, yeah. So, um. Originally, I had actually bought some turquoise jewelry and crushed it myself, um, but it's much easier just to buy pre-crushed stone. Um, and then it's basically just glued into a channel and then carefully shaped down and then blended into the ring. So what did you use to cover that with? Um, so the big secret that every everybody uses to cover and waterproof basically all non-metallic uh, materials is super glue. Hmm. What? Yep. Thin super glue. Apply it with a. Uh, I just use a paper towel, and then you can. It actually uh, forms a really hard, cr- clear coating that you can polish and buff. Interesting. So, um, that's that's the main thing that people use. There's a few people that use like a UV curing resin. Um. But yeah, I was thinking resin. The problem with resin is that it takes such a long time that you have to yeah. keep turning the ring. Yeah. So otherwise, it'll you know mm. all slide to one edge. Um, the UV stuff it works okay. I made a UV bath essentially out of two <laughs> UV uh, nail polish curing machines. <laughs> Ta- they're just taped together so that it's like UV lights all the way around. And then nice. I use that to cure my UV stuff and also to charge my glow in the dark uh, things. But that works okay. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be as hard uh, as super glue. I, it's supposedly as hard as a hard hat, but it feels always a little tacky to me. There's a lot of experimentation going on. Um, a lot of the, the main styles you, you see, uh, people always try to put some kind of spin on them to make them really unique. And there's. There's some awful adaptations, but there's some good ones too. So that's kind of what I do. And besides that, uh, I do like pendants. And recently I had uh, Joe 
Joe and some friends helped me with a cuff that I had done. Uh, actually, a couple of different cuffs that uh, never really went anywhere, but turned out pretty cool. They were fun. They were really fun to make. It was a cool project. Mm-hmm. So what's next? What's yeah. on the horizon? What's next for me? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I'm kind of at a segue. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to... Uh, segue is not really the right word. Kind of at a crossroads where I can either... I can either try to take this business to the next level, which I don't know that I necessarily want to do, and scale it up, end up with employees down the line and that sort of thing. I have to teach people how to make rings and I'm not sure how to handle the quality side of that thing. Um, or I can I can just keep it small. It's kind of a side project, uh, which is probably what I'll end up doing. So as far as what's next, it'll probably be a focus on increasing quality, learning, basically perfecting um, my craft, uh, essentially. Um, I do still have room for improvement, as always. Um, but that's probably what will happen. I have, jeez, uh, oh, I don't even know how many designs that I still want to try. I have materials stacked up that I've bought, you know, months and months ago that I <laughs> was like, Man, I, I can't wait to use this. And then now it's been six months and I haven't touched it yet. <laughs> yeah. But it's coming. It's coming. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Boy, I know that feeling. I was just cleaning my garage, going, there's so many things I haven't started yet. <laughs> well, I, I bought I bought a top fuel dragster connecting rod that I'm gonna use as the liner for a Fordite ring. And I, like, got the Fordite blank, and I got it shaped. And then I bought this rod in April, and I haven't touched it since. <laughs> so <laughs> I need to do that, but I just have not yet. So how do you handle different ring sizes? So that's always tricky. Um, uh, whenever <laughs> so whenever I have a, a show or some kind of thing where I'm displaying my rings, you know, people come up and they – I have uh, – basically one of every style but in my size that i make so that i can wear it and test it out uh, and people will come on and try to put it on and i have gigantic fingers so it fits <laughs> it fits basically no one and they're just like <laughs> they, the look on their face when they like keep trying them on and they're all too big and they're like oh how does this work and then i have to explain that um basically go to a jewelry store have them size your finger since it's something that's extremely critical to get right, let me know, and then I'll just make it exactly for you. Uh, it makes it trickier to do any kind of um, mass production. Um, mm -hmm. And by mass, I mean more than one at a time, because you know some of these materials uh, are hard to find and expensive, and I don't really want to sit on a bunch of ring sizes that'll never sell. Right. Right. So. It gets tricky. Um, I do I do have uh, one place in Peoria that buys my rings and sells them. Uh, at Rambler, uh, which is a pretty awesome men's boutique oh, store. Nice. Yeah. Uh, if you've never been there, go check it out. Drew's a good guy. They've got a lot of cool stuff in there. <clears throat> but uh, he just has various sizes. Um, we've kind of narrowed it down to uh, what seems to be popular for his customer base, and he stocks those. Um, but basically all the rings that I make cannot be resized. So it's extremely critical <laughs> to get that right. Um, First and, time. Yeah. yeah. And as far as how I size them, uh, there is a, actually a standard, I believe it's an ANSI standard for ring size that, uh, converts it into a diameter. So I have a chart for that. Uh, and then I use mandrels. Uh, you've seen like the tapered mandrels. They have mm -hmm. the size notches on them to check uh, afterwards. So there's a there's a few ways to get it right. Um, uh, it can be tricky. There's different ways to measure it on a mandrel, but I try to just stick with uh, with the actual diameter size. That's the that's what I think is the best way. So are you starting with a large diameter stock and then just trim it down to size or? So it depends. Um, depends on what it's going to be. If I buy a metal, 
I'll try to buy somewhere like inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter bar stock solid, and then I just drill that out and use it for whatever ring size I would need. Uh, other things like wood, um, I just buy a large enough block that I can cut off a slice and either use a hole saw or just turn it around from whatever shape it starts in. Hmm. Okay. There's a, a pretty wild amount of things you can do. I've recently gotten into like resin casting. Um, so there's like a just a mind-boggling amount of things you can do with that between you know combining it with woods or casting different things in it like uh money or uh people do like flowers and all kinds of like glow powders and yeah I mean it's it's nuts. And I've been talking to Joe about doing a doing a table here. So maybe in the spring ah. when it won't take like weeks for the resin to cure when it's zero out. Yeah. <laughs> we can we can look at doing that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, I would love to hear more how that goes because I am currently looking at doing a resin cast for my dining room table. So that'll be something cool to hear how it goes. So maybe I can actually learn something. <laughs> nice. Start saving now. Yeah, it's going to be expensive. <laughs> resin, resin is very, very yeah, expensive. <laughs> it's probably going to be $400 in resin, not counting labor and cost mm. of the slab. Yeah. Yeah. But there's there's a reason sure why Jay cool. and I haven't been playing with it for, for fun. <laughs> I told you I'd buy the Fair resin enough. if you get the slab. Oh, we've got the slabs. I'll get one. Let's do it. They're all in a storage unit near RCL. So if you want to well, go pick the... through the slabs, you just have to let Jay know, and he'll he'll take you to the storage unit of slabs. Perfect. <laughs> in, in the spring, we should do that. So we're about at the. 48-ish minute mark. Um, any other l final parting words you guys like to add? I'm good. How are things with the space? Space is awesome. We didn't talk about the space at all tonight. No, we didn't. I know. We got the laser working at the space again. Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you yeah, guys. We, we put the laser back together. And I I fired it. It just like we moved it from across town. We disassembled the laser gantry from the laser. We disassembled the laser tube from the laser. And the laser frame went through two different vehicles and was relocated like four or five different times as we were moving into the space. And we bolted everything back together and set the tube in, in place. And it still shot the beam through the laser head. Yeah, that was a bit remarkable. That was incredible. So for a sense of scale, this is our, like, what, three foot by four foot custom built laser. Yes, it has a beam path of almost nine feet. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And it still shot through the laser head. I was floored. It was well, and not only that, it, like, I, we, I personally don't know if he listens, but, um, Fred, our treasurer and also badass, uh, who has put in numerous amounts of hours into getting this thing to work, who has redone structural integrity things to make this thing just the beast that it will eventually be for everybody who uses it, um, could not be thanked any more than he already has been. He, he is amazing. He's been incredible. He's been working on this thing. And like, it's... It's thanks to all of the efforts of everybody who went into this thing that it has gone this well. And it's just, it's incredibly to see like a group build like this come together and be this awesome. For the record, if your makerspace would like to build a laser cutter, I recommend not to. Just <laughs> <one>. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember Four years yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, unfinished for a long time. They're real fun, but you know. Other people want to use the laser too. Just buy it. It'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, how long did it take? Like three, three years? years? Three yeah. three to three and a half years to actually get it to the point where it is. And now, granted, had I actually had time to work on this thing, it probably would have taken about two and a half weeks to build. But I don't believe you. <laughs> Someone knows Joe. 
<laughs> no, time. I mean, like time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Quentin, I want to thank you for being uh, on the show. Yeah, no problem. Very interesting learning about your process and all the trade secrets. Yeah. Maybe sometime I'll have to uh, come do a build at the makerspace or something. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Come teach a ring class. We have a lathe. Oh, I could probably do that. We're That'd be awesome. Forge too. You got a pretty nice lathe. Yeah. Mm, that was why I sold you my lathe. That's probably the lathe like, I would buy if I was going to replace the one I have now. Yeah. And then I was like, man, I'm never at the makerspace. I shouldn't have sold my lathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I buy another one, I'll sell it back to you. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Still has the original belt on it. I told you, man. Just don't mess up, and the belt won't break. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really done anything too bad. I've stopped the chuck a couple times. Yeah. But, I broke one uh, belt in the entire time I had it. So, my belt's seen some things. I've ruined several, several really nice carbide drills, but. Well, it's not really the lathe's fault. No, no. <laughs> that that's the titanium. Yeah, it's uh, I I got a piece that must have been hardened or something because it it just it'll just completely destroy a brand new regular drill bit like in, instantaneously. Just will not drill it no matter how hard you try. Cutting fluid, no cutting fluid, fast, slow, doesn't matter. It just will not drill it with a regular drill. That was kind of like how slotting my wedding ring went. So my, my wedding ring has a, a horizontal slot through the actual ring body. And I tried to slot it with a slitting saw on my mill. And I ruined three uh, <laughs> saw blades. Like, they just, like, bent over. <laughs> I was like, okay. Gee. So then I yeah. went and bought the EDM guy at work a coffee. And he put a slot in it for me. And, like, <laughs> yeah, there you go. It Take around big guns to do that. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that was I'm, awesome yeah. chatting with you guys. Yeah, thanks for being yeah. on, man. Yep. Yeah, no problem. All right. How do we end this? <laughs> this is the end of the episode. 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 Episode.